very warm welcome to this one hour webinar that is hosted by the IIEA, the Institute of International and European Affairs in Ireland, together with Think Tank Europa in Copenhagen. And this event is part of an international project called Europe's Digital Future, which is coordinated by the IIEA and supported by Google. And as part of this project, a network of think tanks and research institutes in several European countries in Ireland, Sweden, the Netherlands, Denmark and Estonia are exploring what the concept of digital sovereignty means and what future it will herald for the EU and particularly for small and open economies. The network held its first joint event in Dublin in July this year, and today's event is the second in a series of project events taking place in member state capitals, with the first event actually taking place on Tuesday in Stockholm on the Digital Markets Act, hosted by the Stockholm Free World Forum. And you can learn more about the project and you can see earlier events and publications on www.iiea.com. And that brings me to the focus of today's webinar, which is the European CHIPS Act that was proposed by Commission President Ursula von der Leyen in her State of the Union address in September. And as far as I understood, that was also the first time that most people heard about it. The broader context of the European CHIPS Act is, of course, already well known to most of us. It is the debate about European strategic autonomy or sovereignty, as we also heard French uh, President Macron uh, is his favorite way of putting it in, when he set out the French presidency conclusions yesterday. And what is um, motivated uh, is this almost perfect storm of the COVID pandemic, America first rhetoric in the US, the remarkable rise of China as this technological superpower, which has made many Europeans uh, suddenly very aware of the shortcomings of our more than 30 year approach to, to almost untamed supply chains. And one of the things that make uh, me very excited about this focus on the CHIPS Act today is that it's one of the to date most concrete examples of how to put figures, how to put um, factory location discussions into this debate about strategic autonomy. But of course, the most exciting thing is our three distinguished speakers that we have with us today. We have uh, Kim Jørgensen, Head of Cabinet of Commission Executive Vice President Margrethe Vestager, representing, so to say, the architects behind the European CHIPS Act. We have Thomas Bustrup, Deputy CEO of the Confederation of Danish Industries, representing the industry of a small open economy. And then we have Greg Slater, Vice President and Senior Director for Global Regulatory Affairs in Intel with us to give us also the perspectives from across the Atlantic. And I will proceed in this order of speakers and ask each speaker to give us a short introduction. And then we will follow in the end with possible questions also from you listening to the webinar. So please uh, feel free to use the chat function on this Zoom call and we'll try to read out questions during the discussion. But that's it for me in terms of introduction. I'd like to give the floor to you, Kim. Thanks very much for being with us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Katarina, and, and uh, also looking forward to have the discussion with, with Thomas and, and, and Greg. As you said, this is a very, very topical uh, issue. Uh, the current uh, global shortages have exp ex uh, exposed clearly the critical uh, importance of semiconductors across a broad, broad range of European industry from automotive to healthcare. And I think it's also a, a, a clearly that the shortage is slowing down uh, the recovery in, of key economic sectors in Europe. As, as we all have seen, it has forced automakers uh, around the EU to hold productions here at the end of the year. And I think it could also have effect on, on, on other, other sectors. And, and the shortage highlights the fragility of the semiconductor supply chain and the dependency of a limited number of companies and geographies in a, in a, in a tense ge geopolitical context. The supply chain uh, largely relies on the US for general design and on Asia as a hub uh, of semiconductor manufacturing. And this poses a risk uh, to our global competitiveness and resilience. Um, furthermore, the dependency uh, has, has also, is also um, exasperated by the extremely high barriers to entry and capital intensity for in, of the sector, as well as its particularly relevance for existing and future security and defense uh, applications. 
So we have all seen a lot of uh, rumors uh, also about uh, the and, and statements on the US and China already investing uh, heavily in expanding their semiconductor capacity. We have seen it also in Japan, South Korea, and, and uh, we have seen that large foreign companies are also taking a lead in the investment. Uh, they're also looking forward to hear you, Greg, uh, but, but we have already seen that TSMC in Taiwan plans to spend around 100 million uh, billion US dollars over the next three years. And, and, and you are having plans around uh, 80 billion, but, but you can come back to that. So, so it, it, it is, it's, is, as you said, a very, very topical uh, issue and it, it is extremely important, but it's not a, a new thing that we are also talking about uh, the supply chain of semiconductors at, at European level. We have, we have had the key digital technologies joined on the take, taking founded by Horizon Europe, which focuses on, on research and development. And, and, and here we have also been, 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 been looking at it. We have also funded uh, around uh, 1.8 billion uh, euros from, from the European Union for, for, for this. We have also launched an industrial uh, alliance on processors and semiconductor technologies that was launched, I think, in July uh, this year. So, so, um, so it's, it's not a, a, a new thing, so to say. Uh, and what we are doing in, with the Alliance and, and, and other initiatives is to try to, to focus on the current gaps in production of microchips and the technology development needed for companies and organizations to drive no matter uh, their size. And we have also um, support, uh, the Commission support member states in the process to set up uh, IPCAI, the important project of common European uh, interest of, of micro uh, electronics, uh, which is also, uh, and where the aim is to bring together knowledge, exper expertise, financial resources, and economic access from across the union, where the aim is to deliver uh, the key breakthrough technologies and critical infrastructures needed to address big societal changes where the market alone is unable to do it. And, and we have also streamlined our, our state aid rules uh, to, uh, to make it uh, possible to, to help uh, in, in this uh, IPCAI uh, process. So, so um, I think we, we have paid quite a lot of attention and that's where the European chip act came up. So it, it's correct that it's a new uh, sort of uh, the, the team, the, the, the term was, 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 was done by the president in her State of the Union uh, speech uh, on the 15th of, 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 of September. Uh, and, and this will not be a short-term initiative. We will need to work on this for a long-term uh, focus. And I think the aim of the CHIPS Act, which have not been tabled yet, which we will table it in this first half of next year, I think we will have three dimensions, research and development and innovation, that's the first one, and then production as the second one, and international cooperation and partnership as the third dimension. I think it's, it's extremely important also to, to, to folks who note that, that uh, we have already a very successful research and development in Europe. Uh, we have some of the leading research and development companies in on semiconductors in Europe. We have AMAC, we have Fraunhofer, we have CAA and Letty, and I think it's, it's very important also to, 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 to keep this and to develop a new generation of chips that can be produced in Europe, but it's also a, a key to accelerate the early adoption of inno innovative uh, semiconductors technologies by the European uh, industry. Uh, and I think it's, it's also important uh, to note, I mean, I think we have all, at, at least I have learned a lot on chips here in the region's month. Also, what is cutting edge chips, uh, it, and we are not only need to produce the, the smallest chips, as I thought in the beginning, we definitely also need uh, to produce uh, so-called legacy chips, that the one we are using in, in a lot of the cars, and we are using in fridges and coffee machines, so we need to produce a wide range of, of, of chips, and I think nobody can, can produce everything themselves. As I said, the interest by years financially is extremely high. And we also need uh, to do, uh, be able to make uh, the, the chips productions also in a more energy efficient way. It's, uh, it, that's also a very important part uh, of this. But as I said, uh, we need to have a clear picture also of the bottlenecks in the semiconductor supply chains in the different 
types of components for the main markets, it is necessary to anticipate for, uh, fu uh, possible future disruption and to ensure uh, resilience of the entire supply chains. And we also need to make sure that if and where it makes sense, the production can take place in the EU as well. It will require massive public and private investment. Uh, as regards state aid, the Commission will con consider approving support to, to fill possible funding gaps in the semiconductor ecosystem, in particularly for European first-of-a-kind facilities. And this ass assessment will be based on the EU treaty, which is what we always do. If there are no state aid guidelines, then can cover such measures. But what is also extremely important is, is that the objective of the CHIPS Act is not self-sufficiency, and, and self-sufficiency in this area will remain an illusion because nobody can, can do anything. And I think that was also uh, when we had the, the tra Trade and Tech Council in Pittsburgh and ending of the se September with the US, I think this was also the very clear message that we received uh, from the US side. And I'm just coming back from Washington, and I think it was also repeated uh, in the meetings we had uh, here in this in, in, in this week. And, and as I said, uh, it's because the investments needed are so 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 big and, and, and so huge that nobody can do everything uh, together. And that's also why international partnerships will be ex extremely uh, Im, Im important. Uh, and that's why the US are working on their US CHIPS Act which uh, I think will be adopted either at the end of this year or the beginning of next year. The e European Chips Act will be adopted in the first half of next year. We have seen huge investment by, by Japan, huge investment by, by South Korea. And I think it's also fairly clear that, that uh, what, what is needed is not a, a, a short-term supply chain problem, uh, supply, uh, yeah, su su shortage of supply. I don't think we will be over it in, in a few months. Uh, we can also see that, for example, the numbers of chips in a, in a, in a normal car is around 500. I think in, an, in the electric car tomorrow, it will be 2,000 chips. So, so I think we, 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 we need uh, to establish a production of chips to be able to, to have a uh, secure uh, supply chains. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop here and looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Kim, very much for setting up the scene here and also uh, coming, um, touching upon your own journey on, on learning about chips in the recent months and my, my um, and it's, it's also fascinating to hear your your reflections on, on the US uh, possible cooperation coming back having just been in the US and also that this will be a, a key part of the chips act when we see a table next year but my um, it seems that now now the focus is on, on getting the chips act going but the lack of semiconductors in Europe and Europe's small road in this seems to be only just one symptom of a broader um, strategic yet yeah, dependency of Europe uh, in a number of areas today. How much do you see the CHIPS Act as part of a broader change in, in the approach of, of Europe industrial policy to, to, uh, to having maybe more of a state or public role in, in shaping what should be done and when? Do you have any comments on, on the broader debate that we are part of. No, it, it's fairly clear that, 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 that there is a broader context. I mean, we have, we have seen, uh, we had an updated industrial strategy we adopted last year. We had just adopted a communication on competition policy. I think it's extremely important that we are also seeing uh, supply chains uh, here. Competition is also what makes us resilient, uh, basically. So, so we also need to, 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 to make sure that, that, that we are also focusing on, on, on the right areas. And I think it's also very important with the, the chip sacks. I think there is a particular uh, problem and, 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 and challenge in uh, the supply chain of semiconductors. And that's why I think we have we will adopt the chip sack. That's also why uh, we will be ready um, with all, all the, uh, the things that we have when we give state aids. We will even go as far as, as allow to, to, to give state aids for production here. But I think this is because we think, feel that this is a, a particularly uh, area, but it's also very important that we make sure that this happens in an open environment so that we don't pour money into only three member states and close it for, for the rest, and that we don't, don't ruin this excellent research and development environment we actually already have with, with for example, AMAC uh, in, in, in Leuven in, in Belgium. And, and we also uh, know that we have uh, the ASML production of, 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 of microchip machines in, in the Netherlands. So we actually 
have already uh, a good uh, starting point in, in, in Europe. Uh, but, but again, we have set the goal that we want to be uh, able to produce 20% of, of all the, the microchips uh, in, in 10 years time. Whether that's uh, doable or not, I, I, I don't know, because in, in 10 years times, the production will be mo most probably four times as much as today. So it's part of a, a, a broader picture, but I think it's very important that we also make sure that this happened in an open environment and, and where the aim is to, to, to make sure that we have uh, a secure supply chain and a secure supply chain is not only one factory. That's the whole point that it, it, it doesn't mean that we have to do everything in Europe because when it comes to chips, that's not possible. And do you think this balance on keeping the focus on, on where there are critical lacks in Europe um, is, is somehow, has it become more difficult to sustain after Brexit? Is there also some kind of, is, is this also part of the process of the EU having, so to say, lost its one of its most free trade oriented members? Or is this simply this almost perfect storm I was setting out before about post pandemic, post America first and, and so forth? But the Americans uh, are also saying that they cannot do uh, everything on their own and the UK will not be able to do everything on their own. I think we need to work together. But it's also clear that the balance on sort of uh, free trade has already changed before Brexit or it ha at least started, uh, at least I've been working on these matters for, for quite some years. And, and it, it, I think it has shown that we can no longer depend on only one factory. But that doesn't mean that we have to bring home uh, production in all areas to, to Europe, because I, I don't think that's the way to do it. We just have to diversify our supply chain. So it's correct that, that, that maybe the free trade balance has, has, has altered a bit with UK leaving the EU, but it has already, it would have changed anyway because of China and because of other things around in the globe. Great. Thanks very much, Kim. We'll, we'll get back to you in the discussion part, but I think that is a very appropriate point for turning to, to Thomas Bustrup, Deputy CEO of the Confederation of Danish Industries, because Thomas, what we hear often from, from the Danish industry point of view is how important it is to, to, uh, to not throw the, all the values out on the European internal market and how we have been used to doing things for many years because it has really tremendously benefited, especially a small open economy such as the Danish. So I would be very uh, curious to hear your perspectives on this, including how worried you are that this might be a lasting uh, development towards more state aid and, and that kind of development in Europe. But over to you, Thomas. Yes. Uh, thank you, Katharina. Hi, you And um... Also, uh, good to be with you, Kim and Greg. Uh, looking forward to to uh, also the, uh, the the question and answers afterwards. Uh, you are a hundred percent correctly in your introduction, Katarina, that uh, coming from a business organization uh, in a small open economy with uh, a lot of uh, members being extremely dependent on the internal market, uh, this is something that we have uh, our our focus on. Uh, on the one side, on the other side, we just asked uh, our members that are dependent on on uh, on uh, um, uh, uh, microchips. Uh, you know, uh, to what extent does this lack of microchips actually affect severely their their turnover right now and their their possibility of of meeting the demands? And 75% of them said that there's, there's a huge problem in this, in this uh, shortage of uh, microchips that we're seeing right now. So uh, it, this, this, is, uh, this is truly a serious uh, challenge for, for many of our members uh, at the one side. And at the other side, we, we need to, to safeguard some of the, the, uh, the things that we have built up with the internal market and less state aid uh, in, in Europe for, for many, many years. Um, just a few comments on what are they doing right now? Uh, how, how are they, they coping with this uh, situation? Uh, many of them are trying to uh, diversify their supply chains. But of course, as this is a global problem, uh, global challenge, this is not very easy. Some are trying to redesign their products so that they are, they are less dependent on, on microchips 
or that they are less dependent on certain microchips that they think are, are even tougher to get than others. Uh, so there's happening a lot in, in, in the research and development departments uh, around in, in, in all the companies. Uh, and, and I think this is, is valid for all Europe. Um, we actually have a, a discussion here in Denmark uh, or an issue. Uh, people are, are, some companies are, are correctly um, um, uh, connecting this to the, to the pandemic. Uh, so they are also asking for compensation uh, schemes. This is what we have seen during the pandemic that restrictions on, on certain sectors and certain areas have, have led to the Danish government gave, giving compensation schemes, and and some of our members are now asking for the same. Of course, this is a this is a, again a, a balance because this is not uh, this lack of microchips is not coming out of restrictions. It's it's, it's simply coming out of a, the, the situation where demand and supply is uh, is uh, is in uh, is in 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 an imbalance. Um, what have we done? <clears throat> We try to set up a, a, a group of companies uh, together with some of the companies that we also have in Denmark that that uh, that are supplying microchips, not because they are producing it, but because they are they are agents for some of the big uh, microchips uh, producers uh, around in the world. Uh, this doesn't solve the problem, but at least it uh, it allows them to to share best practices. It allows them to share. Um, uh, um, experiences on, on how to, to handle this situation, this very, very difficult uh, situation. Uh, then you mentioned uh, also the Microchip Act. And, uh, and I mean, it really, in, it makes sense uh, in, uh, in, a, in, in many ways also, uh, as Kim uh, just explained, uh, of course, it will it will it will not uh, it will not uh, it will not uh, solve the acute uh, shortage of microchips that we have right now. Uh, that that doesn't mean we, we shouldn't look into the future, but it's just it's it's very important to say that that uh, it, it it's uh, it's it's not uh, something that will solve the situation right now. Um, and. Uh, uh, probably you could say some of the existing uh, producers are, I, I presume, and I have heard that they are investing already heavily in, in boosting their production capacities. Uh, and uh, this is not new production capacities, it's, it's boosting the existing ones. And, and that will probably be ready earlier than, than if Europe were to, to, um, to, um, to set up new production capacities. So this is it's just to, to mention that, uh, that, that there will be some kind of market correction to this. And the ones that will probably be able to, to solve the market situation quickly will probably be the, the producers, the factories that are all, already now producing microchips. Um, so the CHIPS Act is also, and this is also what Kim mentioned, it, it's, it's not only to solve the demand situation in the long run, it's also a strategic outlook. I mean, it is, it is a, a way of securing that we will not uh, get into uh, the same situation that we are in now because of, you could say, um, strategic uh, um, decisions made by other superpowers. Let's put it in that way. Um, so, uh, we think that it, it, it makes, it makes uh, sense. Uh, of course, it's extremely important that we, that we uh, develop this uh, production in Europe in, in the way that we think also solves the demand that European companies have in the future. I'm not a, I'm not a microchips expert, but as far as I understand it, that uh, a lot of the demand from, from European uh, producers are, are sort of less advanced microchips that you see in, in, in other products. So they should, of course, be put in very much into consideration when, when developing the CHIPS Act and, and, and implementing the, uh, the CHIPS Act. 
Um, yes, uh, just a little bit on the long term uh, political uh, measures. Um, uh, uh, yeah, Kim also mentioned this. Maybe the objective should not be to be sort of the global leader in advanced manufacturing of microchips, but it should be a, a, a position where we are at least in the game. And whether it's 20% or less or more, uh, yeah, I don't know either. Uh, but but uh, yeah, uh, uh, an ambition to be in the game without of sort of being the, uh, the, uh, the, the leader of it. Um, also, again, because I mean, I think other regions are really, really massively boosting their production uh, uh, right now. Um, and and from a market perspective, of course, so there is there's a risk of of overcapacity, and uh, and then when you have overcapacity, it will it will lead to uh, to protectionism, and uh, it could lead even to anti-dumping duties and and stuff like that. And, uh, and probably the production in Europe will, at the end of the day, not be fully comp uh, competitive with, with productions uh, taking uh, place in, in Asia, for, for example. So, um, to conclude, yes, European industry, Danish companies, severely impacted at the moment by shortage of uh, microchips. Uh, we need to try and find some short-term solutions to the problem even though they are very, very difficult to find. Uh, and we uh, also need, of course, to look at the long term. Uh, and uh, also the security for European companies of, of having access uh, to microchips uh, in, the, in the future. Uh, and um, again, it's still very important that these solutions are are tailored in the way that it is in in line, you could say, with the overall uh, ideas and and uh, of, of of the of the internal market in uh, in Europe. Uh, thanks. That would be my introduction. Thank you very much, Thomas. Also for pointing out, I mean, quite a dramatic figure you found in your study that seventy five percent, if I heard you correct, of Danish uh, companies today have some shortage of other of your members. Um. And, but also the, the, the gap between the current shortage and then what's being proposed right now, it's, it's two different I mean, it's two different things we're talking about. But um, now that, that uh, and I think I also heard, I mean, quite a I mean, backing for, from your side to, to the initiatives being taken right now to avoid such crisis in the future. But actually Denmark is one of the few member states who have not set aside resources in the recovery fund after COVID for joining these IPCAIs that Kim spoke about, these important projects of common European interest, which are a way to give state aid to, to develop, to, to respond to any uh, need, any de dependencies. And also we have not specifically uh, any plans to join the, uh, the microchip in the, or the micro industry uh, IPCAIs. Is that, Thomas, in your view, um, uh, do we have to somehow realize that now this is the new Christmas tree and we need to put our, uh, to put everything we can to, to decorate that? Or, or do you think it is, it is okay to, to, to somehow stand, uh, be one of the member states who are on the sidelines here and even though others might move ahead on Kais and, and other of these projects, but what would be your concerns from the industry perspective? Well, I think it's it's uh, it, it's a signal of uh, of the way that we look at state aid in in Denmark. It, um, uh, both the government, the Danish government, but but also they depended on 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 our view on this, and we have we've we've discussed this with uh, with our with our members uh, whether to join this or not. Um, and uh, despite the fact that so many of our members are actually lacking microchips right now, they don't feel that they are sort of part of the solution. Uh, they don't feel they have the competences uh, and the knowledge and the background for actually being part of a, a, a project, a European project uh, with, with state aid uh, that they can, can contribute to. So I think 
their viewpoint, it's a bit idealistic, but it's not so far from the truth is that, you know, we should give the state aid to the companies in Europe that are best able actually to solve this problem in the future. And they don't think that they are among those companies. They are demanding the projects, uh, the, the products, sorry, but, but they don't think that they are part of the solution of actually producing microchips in the, in the future. I think that's a, uh, that's a signal that the Danish uh, business environment is, is giving here. We, we're backing up the project, uh, but we think that there, there are companies in Europe that are more capable of actually solving uh, solving this than than uh, than Danish companies. Um, then there are other projects on 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 hydrogen and uh, where, where where Danish business community uh, to a very very high extent is is sort of uh, putting themselves uh, available to to actually solve that uh, on a European level, but not uh, apparently not when it comes to uh, to production of microchips. Yeah, thanks. So it is uh, it is not just a, a bandwagon. You have to jump on at any price or any cost. It is a, a, a question about the strength in, in the country. We here now, there might also be a need Kai on, on health issues. So uh, yes. there might be yeah. many to consider in the near future. Yeah. But I would uh, thank you very much, Thomas. And also we will get back to, to discuss more in, in a little while. But we'll turn to, uh, to Greg Slater. Uh, you are joining us, if I understood correctly, from California, so it's actually 3 a.m. If I understood correctly, maybe 3.30 right now. It's very impressive that you're, you're with us. You're Vice President and Senior Director of Global Regulatory Affairs for Intel. We already heard about the US perspective uh, from Kim, who just back from the States, about the Trade and Tech Council, and also uh, Kim's Commissioner Margrethe Veste in a recent speech talked very much about possible cooperation, quite concrete initiatives and proposals for cooperation on something like chips and, and uh, how to, to make sure that the US Chips Act and the European Chips Act somehow speak together and promote the same values. I would, I'm very keen to hear from you, Greg, what your perspective is on this discussion of a European Chips Act. So the floor is yours. Thank you, and I'll, and I'll come back to that point about collaboration in a minute. So I, I'm actually in Arizona. California is one hour behind us. So it's 2 a.m., 2.30 a.m. there. Arizona is where we have our largest manufacturing site, and that's where I'm based. But I've been to Ireland, of course, because we have a large operation there. But the short answer to the thought-provoking question for this panel is that the EU Chips Act will put the EU at the center of the next-gen semiconductor ecosystem if it is properly shaped and eff effectively implemented. And for me to watch both the US, the development of the US and the EU Chips Act is fascinating because both uh, we've, we face the same problem, um, significant decline in manufacture of semiconductors um, and the vulnerability to one small area of the world where nearly all our semiconductor supply comes from. And as you mentioned, Katrina, yesterday at an event in the US, EU Commissioner Vestager acknowledged the urgent need to increase semiconductor manufacturing capacity in the EU, as did Kim. EU Commissioner Breton also strongly supports this effort, labeling it as one of the three dimensions for a successful EU Chips Act. While these leaders have slight different, slightly different approaches, um, the important point is that they see uh, common problems with our critical industry and they share a common vision on how to fix them. At Intel, we're very supportive of the vision behind the EU Chips Act. It's a crit critical or crucial initiative by the EU to restore resilience in the EU supply chains. And second, um, we believe it should focus on stimulating capability as well as capacity because of the synergistic effects that happen between them that need to be captured to achieve technology leadership. The EU Chips Act will help the EU meet its 2030 digital targets by accelerating EU leadership in important areas like ener energy efficient data centers, communication infrastructure, and artificial intelligence. All resources, all resources should be mobilized and, and the entire um, policy toolbox should be used under an over, my understanding is what it would be an overarching framework to set, set up, to, including a dedicated European semiconductor fund. As Kim said, and I believe Commissioner Vestager also said, the goal shouldn't be the 
uh, be completely self-sufficient because in their words, that's an illusion in our complex and highly specialized industry with a global supply chain. Rather, it should be to create strategic autonomy in, in the semiconductor supply chain where, where there are single points of failure that matter the most from an economic and national security perspective. We welcome the new competition rules that Kim mentioned. Um, it is important to align the EU CHIPS Act with the existing funding vehicles like IPSI or IPCAI that was mentioned, which is a great tool, but it's not very well suited for a strategic private commercial production. And also to align, align the CHIPS Act with financial instruments like the National Recovery Funds and Horizon Europe while pursuing other needed solutions like uh, the dedicated funding to fill um, critical ecosystem gaps by supporting first of a kind facilities that Kim mentioned. So we have three recommendations for a successful uh, EU CHIPS Act. First, strengthen the world-class semiconductor research capabilities that already exist in the EU by creating a collaborative mechanism among your premier institutes, institutions like IMAC, Fraunhofer, and CA Leti. One of the lessons learned so far in the new EU CHIPS, uh, sorry, the new US CHIPS Act is that it sets up legislatively a number of R&D programs, but doesn't really tie them together um, to more effectively bring innovation from the lab to the fab. The US Commerce Department has asked the US Semiconductor Industry Association to do an inventory of the pre-competitive R&D that has been done by government programs and universities to help identify the gaps that should be addressed by the R&D programs that the US CHIPS Act will set up and fund. Maybe the European Semiconductor Alliance can do the same thing. Second, the EU CHIPS Act should support increased capacity, especially for leading edge technologies. Leading edge semiconductors are, are the building blocks for key emerging technologies such as AI, 5G, autonomous driving, photonics, and quantum computing. To be at the forefront of innovation and minimize supply chain disruptions, Europe needs to invest in both, both the design and manufacture of leading edge chips. I think Kim mentioned this too. A recent Kearney report forecasts that the demand for leading edge semiconductors in Europe will grow at 15% CAGR through 2030, much faster than demand, the growth of demand at lagging um, nodes, even though that's also important as Kim mentioned. Leading edge design and chip manufacture, when they're located near each other, are much stronger um, together because of the synergistic effects that happen. And investing in both will fulfill the use goal of restoring tech leadership in, the, in our industry. So the EU needs to make investments to continue to protect current leadership in areas like R&D and tool making, but also make investments with the private sector where it needs to catch up, such as in advanced chip making. I think Kim already alluded to this, building new leading edge fabs is not cheap. 17 billion euros for two fabs um, and 11 billion euros to operate those two fabs over a 10 year period. And we face these economic headwinds with the massive subsidies that are given elsewhere. And so there, there will need to be a private, private public you know, investment to close that cost gap. And the difficulty here is that te technology continues to get more and more expensive. Right now, a 30% increase with each new generation. The last recommendation we have is that the EU CHIPS Act should promote collaboration. We're helpful to Europe's goals. And Kim already mentioned this. So I will just mention two possibilities here that the EU US CHIPS Act um, creates. The, that act has a what's called a, a multilateral security fund where with allies, the allies can share uh, funds to develop um, uh, collaborative research, pre-competitive research and develop standards that help like common export control uh, standards or regulations. And so that's an interesting concept. In addition, the US CHIPS Act sets up the National Semiconductor Technology Center um, and, and allocates a fair amount of funding to that. Um, I know the U.S. Commerce Intel is certainly supportive of the what, the NSTC National Semiconductor Technology Center collaborating with IMEC, finding gaps in R&D, um, to and collaborating together so that it's less expensive to move R&D forward and develop uh, 
leadership and, and uh, sustainment in that important function. So those are just two examples of where the US and the EU could collaborate to, to address common problems. Thank you. Thanks very much, Greg, for these very concrete recommendations for the European chip cycle. And I would love, of, obviously, to hear Kim's uh, reactions. I think they fit very well into some of the three um, aspects, components of the chip cycle that we set out, Kim, maybe not so much the production part of it, but the research and development and the, and the cooperation well, ones. But, but uh, I'll, I'll give the floor to you in a bit. But Greg, maybe just for, for everyone, I mean, when was the first time you heard of a European CHIPS Act? And, what were your main, what was your initial thought? Well, at 3 a.m., I'm not sure my memory is great, but um, it was mid-September, and I'm not sure if it was uh, President von der Leyen's announcement or if it was before then. And my reaction was, this is, this is great. Uh, this is what they should be doing. Um, and as I mentioned already, I think if it's properly shaped and implemented, effectively implemented, it will be a, it will be a big success. Great. Well, that's that's a nice uh, way to hand over to Kim with this support from uh, from Greg in Intel. But Kim, can you maybe just and I'll also just ask Thomas afterwards to just give a, a few maybe reactions also to the different speeches um, we've heard before we have some questions from the audience. But Kim, what would be your your response to to hearing these uh, this feedback on the tips? Uh, thanks a lot, and I and I and I, I I completely agree. But just again to to repeat that. That, that just as I mean the, the US Chips Act, the European Chips Act, I mean it, it's it's a it's a it's a way to 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 put the political focus on the shortage of supply for semiconductors because we could actually do all the different elements in it in what is going to be the Chips Act. We could do that with different programs. Of course, we would need to 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 we can do state aid based on the treaty, we can do uh, IPCAIS and we can do research and development. We have a rise in Europe program, we have connectivity, a Europe a program, but, but it, it's, it's a way to, to say this is a, extremely important politically and therefore we put it together. And I think it's very important that we do cooperate, as I said, uh, with the US, but not only the US, with other like-minded partners, because we, we, we simply need to, to, to also work very closely with, with, with Japan, with South Korea, with, 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 with other, other third countries. And, and, and as Greg rightly said, it, it's, it's, it's what, the, what the US are doing in research and development is basically to, to make a federal system where you connect all the different research uh, yeah. institutes and, and, and companies. And we should do the same at, at European level. Uh, and it would also not be wise if we just, just duplicate each other. And I think in Europe, we have really a, a, a one of the, our leading uh, where we are leading, that is actually on research and development, and we should not ruin that by, by, by taking away customers or taking away part of what is the strength of, of, of for example, AMAC. And we should not just move AMAC or create a second AMAC in, U, in the US, we should cooperate. Uh, and I think that that's very important. And of course, uh, the money needed, uh, I saw also one of the questions in, in, the, in the chat, um, uh, how would, would be the expenditures between EU and member states? It's fairly clear that, that, that the EU budget, I mean, we can find money in, at, at Horizon Europe, we can find money in Connectivity Europe, but when it comes to the actual production there, the EU budget cannot, it, it, that will have to be member states that will have to go in with, and company and private capital, of course. Great, thanks, Kim, also for highlighting the question. I think it was from Paul Udukia about the chip sect, whether it's uh, in the balance between member state and EU funding. But Thomas, uh, before we go back to the uh, questions, uh, your reflections and listening to to Kim and to uh, to Greg here. Um, I mean, how how much are you convinced that this is a necessary long term investment, or do you think that that uh, this transitory problem you were mentioning is uh, is, is something that's that's quite different from from what we are we're engaging on with these uh, much longer and much more committing plans. Do you have any re reactions to the to what you've heard so far? I think it's. Um, um... I mean, the, the 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 world is changing, right? And uh, and uh, and 
raw materials in general, uh, not only uh, semiconductors, but uh, world materials in general is is uh, is uh, is is going to be an even more important part of uh, of um, of uh, developing uh, our economies and developing our businesses. So so uh, so that that we as a continent uh, will need to look at how to ensure supplies of. Of, of raw materials in general, hereby also semiconductors is is a natural step, and uh, and uh, I think that especially also uh, uh, hearing Greg, even though it's uh, three o'clock in the morning, Greg, it's it's very clear what you are saying, and I think it's uh, it's uh, it shows that that a that strong alliance. Uh, between Europe and and the U.S. also in this is something that we that we need to um, to develop. I mean, uh, there are much better um, platforms for for developing the transatlantic uh, cooperation uh, now than than before, and uh, and think this is one of the issues where we have to uh, to do it. Thanks very much, Thomas. I will I will turn to a question now from. Uh, a member of the audience here, Emil Dreusfeld Nielsen, asks, will the European CHIPS Act give birth to EU financial support to new production facilities in Europe, for instance, within the R&D capabilities, thus still aligning EU state aid rules? I wonder if that is mainly for Kim to, to consider. I can also just throw in another question from Seamus Allen. I think that's maybe mainly to Thomas. Uh, Thomas, do you think this current semiconductor, we actually touched a bit about that, is mostly a short-term trans transitory problem that will be resolved by itself in a number of years, even without the CHIPS Act? And also what other th speakers thought about this. We, we heard a, a little bit about that already. And then, um, for Greg Slater, what seems to be the differences and similarities in the approach and emphasis for a CHIPS Act in the EU and the US? So I hope that has given you a few inspiration for some, some future, uh, some, some further discussion here. I think maybe let's uh, turn to, to Greg and see if you want to start on some of this, Greg. Um. So I, I have not seen the EU CHIPS Act yet, but I'll base my comments on what I've, the announcements about it. And I, I think I will go back to something that Kim mentioned that all the existing tools enable the European Commission to um, incentivize uh, and fill the help fill with private investment, the supply chain gaps that they deem most important. I think one of the things I would say is time is of the essence. There is a, there is a sense of urgency here um, private companies that in that are investing in the semiconductor industry are, are private are usually public companies most of them except the startup r d companies and they have they're under a tremendous competitive pressure because it's a very dynamic industry and so decisions have to be made on where to invest and so whether it's the us or the eu chips act they have to be effective in their implementation and maybe that's something that the eu chips act can do better than then uh, by tying all these pieces together that Kim mentioned in, a, in an effective way that complies with uh, state aid uh, um, restrictions. The EU CHIPS Act is, um, there, it's, a, it's a piece of legislation that is pretty high level in a lot of respects and will require rulemaking and that will slow things down. Hopefully the EU CHIPS Act, again, I have not seen it, but hopefully it will maybe a mix of instruments, some of which will speed up the acceleration of the, these, uh, the use of these tools that already exist so that um, we, because the decisions are being made right now on where to invest and you can't take years to do that. So th those are sort of some co general comments. Uh, similarities, there's a, there's a desire to collaborate to do re a realization that no, nobody can do it all. I already mentioned a couple of examples for that. Um, differences is in the US, you have a piece of legislation in the EU, hopefully, maybe there's there's room to to use already the existing toolbox in a more effective way. <clears throat> Thanks. Uh, could you could you just comment a bit on how how the US you think will go about finding partners in terms of this, um, other than Europe? Well, 
So the, the one fund, the, the multilateral security fund, Katrina, talks about allies that have common um, export control views. That's pretty narrow, right? That's pretty narrow. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if under this administration, the current administration that got, um, that was broadened a little bit in terms of the criteria for finding allies to uh, use uh, multilateral funds to achieve common objectives. But that's all that's been discussed so far. And that's all that's on in the legislation so far. Great, thanks. Uh, Kim, can I turn to you also maybe with a comment on the ally uh, partner ideas that, that you, you have in the, in the commission and also maybe elaborate a little bit. There's another question in the audience about uh, the shortage of raw materials for chips and how much that the plan itself, the chips act itself might turn to, to uh, proposals and solutions to address the raw material shortage. Kim. I mean, the, the, the question of, of raw material, it, it's not going to be an, an item in itself, but that's also part of the international partnership, because what, what we also need is to map and to have some kind of an, uh, an, an um, what is it called, alert mechanism, that when we can see that in some months' times, if, if, if the current situation continues, then we will have a shortage of supply of lithium or some other uh, raw materials and where, what can we then do to, to, um, to see if we can find alternative places to, to, to buy some of the smaller items. So, so raw materials is certainly also a very important uh, part of the whole, the whole thing. On, on. And then, um, as, as Greg said, I completely agree that there is a sense of, of, of urgency, but at the same time, it's also correct what, what Thomas said, that in the current situation, uh, if there's not much you can do to help the current shortage of supply because here you can only try to 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 encourage and to to get the companies that are already there to boost their production because you i mean it takes time uh, to build a new fab and and therefore i mean it's it's uh, it's 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 a bit complicated and and we also when we are doing our chip snacks as i said there are several uh, chips, as, as I have now been learning, we have in the beginning, I thought that the cutting edge, that was what everybody wanted, the smaller ones, the very small ones on two nanos, that, that even, even Apple are just trying to design a three nano one for their new iPhone. So they're not even now down to two uh, yet. But in what we were, the strengths of Europe are, is actually more in what we call legacy chips, and that we also need to produce. So we really need also to, to have, so a very important part of both the US Chips Act, but also the European Chips Act is also to mapping the need so that we don't pour in all the money in, in the wrong place, so to say. Uh, I think that's, that's an extremely important part of, of the exercise. And I'm glad that Greg hasn't seen the Chips Act yet because I haven't seen it either. It's in the making. <laughs> And Thomas, uh, what would be your uh, biggest uh, hope that would be in the chip sack and your biggest fear of what would be in it? And maybe also just comment on some of the other questions you've heard. Thomas, are you there? Sorry. I yeah, I think, I think my biggest fear will be exactly what, uh, what uh, Kim just mentioned here. Uh, is that 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 we are putting up uh, production in Europe of of, of chips which are not um, are not uh, in line with the with the demand of the European producers. So so I think we need to be to, to be very clear on on what it is that we need, and basically we have to try and be clear on what is it that we need in five years, because this is probably the time span that we're looking into. <laughs> um, uh, and you, you also mentioned another question before, uh, Katarina. And I, th I mean, I basically believe in the market, uh, also in a in a in a global in a global sense. So, so I think there will be uh, there will be long term market corrections in the way that that the, that the supply will actually meet the demand, even though that the demand will continue to increase over the years. I mean, even more, we've seen a, a big increase in demand for. For microchips uh, for the last 10 years and that will just continue continue and continue but i still believe in 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 that the market will make the corrections and the, the, that the supply will uh, will be there uh, the thing is that um, 
most of the, the increase in the production that we've seen over the last 10 years have, have taken place in China. And, uh, and uh, I think it's just too fair and to say directly that, you know, if we come into a situation like this, and, uh, and most of the, or a, a huge part of the production will take place in China, we will meet uh, probably export uh, restrictions uh, from China. And uh, so they will say that, uh, you know, if, if, if everybody is, is, uh, is lacking microchips, that then the, the, the Chinese companies should, uh, should be first in line. I think that's probably what we're going to see. And this is why that, that this uh, Chips Act, uh, both in the US and in Europe, uh, Makes sense. Thanks. And that brings me also to a question from the audience in terms of how much of the European Chips Act is actually motivated by China. So quite a, a direct uh, question. And, and also a question from uh, Seamus Allen from the IIEA. Um, it seems to be directed mostly at, at you, Greg, but it's, I think it's broader as well in terms to the cooperation between the US and, and the EU on the Chips Act. So um, he's asking what seems to be the differences and similarities in the approach and emphasis for a CHIPS Act in the US and the EU? And uh, does all the speak, do all speakers, do you have perspectives on, um, on how we can ensure that these acts complement each other or if there are any risks of regulatory contradiction and unnecessary duplication and maybe even harmful state-backed competition between the EU and the US resulting as a, thought, as a, as a consequence of this? So I think uh, looking at the time that will actually bring us to the final round of, of comments from, from the three of you. And uh, I think we will, we'll, do this, we'll do the same order as we did the, uh, the, this, the speeches in. So if you can perhaps please reflect on these questions and also make any uh, concluding remark you might want to make, that would be great. Thanks and over to you, Kim. Yeah, I mean, the, the question on, on, on sort of uh, the, the competition and the overlap, I think we've already touched upon this Quite many times, it's it's clear that that I think we we want to do uh, to make production in Europe, and it's also fairly clear that the U.S. are already now building factories in in Arizona, also where where, where Intel are, and and they want to do their own production. So so there will there will be we will and we there will be areas where I think we want to do the same, but I hope that we can also make sure that 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 it would be not very wise if we if all of us were going to make exactly the same chip. And then we would not do all the other chips that is necessary for the for the business environment. So I think that that's where where the kind of the, the the cooperation and coordination come comes into place. And 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 I think it's 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 a very uh, I mean the, the the reasons why we are we are having this discussion today, the reasons why the the US are, are making their chips act, we're doing ours is is of course that that we can all all of us can see that it's not very healthy if all the world's production of microchips is taking place in the same place, we simply need to diversify the supply chain. And, and, and so, so yes, there is, a, of course, an element of, of, of China uh, in, in this place and, and what we have seen of Chinese uh, behavior in other areas. And, and that's also why, why I think as an important part of the, the US uh, chips actually is also export control. That's also an area that's the, the, one of the themes for one of the 10 working groups in the Trade and Tech Council between the EU, EU and the US. That's also one of the areas where we've been discussing export controls with the US and the EU. Great, uh, Thomas. Yeah, uh, on, on, on the question on, on competition between uh, uh, chip acts and US and, and EU, uh, I mean, I think it's, it's, a, it's a very uh, fair question. Uh, I mean, the thing is with, with uh, microchips, it, 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 it it takes a lot of time and a lot, a lot, a lot of money to, to set up the production. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and this would also mean that if you have an overcapacity, uh, then it will cost a lot, a lot of money uh, to, to sort of slow down the production. Uh, so there is a risk of, of sort of uh, this uh, state aid um, production of chip acts uh, of, of microchips will sort of continue 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 but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't go into it it just means that we need to uh, to cooperate very well together and i think especially between the us and uh, and, uh, and and europe excellent and greg your final remarks well, maybe maybe i can build on those comments given, given the shortness of time 
I think one of the differences between the US and the EU is that we're, the US is strong in design. The EU needs to be stronger in design. The US is not as strong in some areas of R&D as Europe. And it needs to strengthen that. But there's certainly ample room for collaboration and cooperation. Maybe the TCC, TTC um, can help there. And it definitely needs to happen. But I, I, I'm not so worried at this point about a race to the bottom from a subsidy perspective or a redundancy perspective, because the US and you are so far behind, at least in the manufacturing area, that does, and, and, it, and it's so expensive to set up those factories and we need so many of them that uh, I think that's, a, that's a, a problem, that, a challenge that we need to worry about down the road um, more than today. Um, and uh, I would just refer again to the Kearney report that estimates that leading edge demand in you will grow 15%, whereas lagging edge, as important as, as that is, it will grow about 3%. And the, U, the US SEC recognizes the same issue where it's funding lagging nodes, but only not, not a whole lot. It's more focused on, on other things. So I think there's some differences and similarities and the TTC can actually help smooth those out and fill in and, and help collaborate, promote the spirit of collaboration. Thank you, Ray. That gives me a positive note to conclude on as well. And um, I, I think we've we've heard from from Kim Jansen. We've heard about the main components of a still unseen Chips Act, what it will focus on. We've heard from from Thomas, uh, the perspective of Danish industry. I think being pragmatic on on this, being being cautious, but also uh, accommodating on the need for for longer term resilience, but still also. Uh, remembering that there is a current shortage, that this is completely a different story. Uh, we learned three concrete recommendations for, for what Europe should put in its CHIPS Act from, from the, across the, the Atlantic Ocean from, from you, Greg. And I think that that has tied very well together in terms of trying to make more sense of, of, of the European CHIPS Act and what it's about. We know it's about tech sovereignty. That was the term under which it was presented by the Commission president. Uh, it's certainly not nice not to be sovereign. So I think the, 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 the shared goal and the joint aims of this will certainly uh, be something that we will continue to hear about in the coming months and years. I would like to thank everyone very much for their contributions. Thank you very much, Greg, especially I think waking up in the middle of the night and, and being able to, to talk about chips production and research and development and all of this. It's, it's, been, uh, it's been fascinating to hear. Thank you, Thomas, for, for coming with the with the uh, input from, a, from the small open economy. And thank you, Kim, for, for having turned up straight after your US journey to share your perspectives with us and, and set out, um, make us, made us all a lot wiser on what, what would be in this document that we're all looking forward to, to seeing next year. So that, will, uh, that concludes our webinar. It has been recorded. So you will be able to, to turn back to, to hear some of the details. So for now, thank you for listening and have a great day and night wherever you are. Thanks very much.